Hello, welcome to this video, which is going to describe the concept behind Lagrange multiplier method. The goal is to maximize a function, we'll call it f, subject to a constraint, and we'll call that g. Here's an example that's going to drive the explanation. I have some function called 4x squared minus 4xy plus y squared, multivariable function of x and y, little f. And my constraint is that x squared plus y squared must be equal to 25. And so geometrically, this means that we're looking for a point x naught y naught on the graph of the constraint curve at which the function f is as large as possible. That constraint curve is a circle of radius 5. So we want to locate such a point by constructing a contour plot. So the red lines represent different altitudes of the function f, different z values, different outputs. The blue, the blue graph represents the constraint curve g. Each point of intersection between the two is a candidate for a solution since they're points that lie on both at the same time. So I've marked off a few of them. I have uh, when f is 25, when f is 50, when f is 75, when f is 100, the different altitudes of f, the different outputs on f coming from also points that are on the circle of radius 5. And then I have marked off in green here the altitude or the height or the output of the function f as a 125. Okay. The largest value of f occurs when these curves just touch each other when they have the same tangent line. So I have my tangent line to the circle and then I have my tangent line to the level curve. Well the level curves happen to be straight lines in this picture and so the tangent curve to the straight line in red would be also this green line that I've drawn in. At this particular point, x naught, y naught, the gradient of the function f is parallel to the gradient of the function g. So what does it mean, the gradient of the function? So the gradient of the function f is this orange vector it is um, the gradient is always going to be perpendicular to the level curve so it must meet this right angle the gradient of the function g um, not necessarily the same vector two vectors are parallel when they are scalar multiples of each other and so these vectors that represent the gradient of f and the gradient of g uh, they point in the same direction they, they, they come off at a right angle to the tangent line. Now, when two vectors are scalar multiples of each other, we could say that one is some scalar times the other. The gradient of f is equal to lambda times the gradient of g. Lambda is our scalar. It's a real number that will say how these gradients are related to each other. So we know that the gradient of g is perpendicular to the level curve that we have here, the blue, the, the, the x squared plus y squared equals 25. And it also passes through our point, x naught, y naught, that we're looking for. This means that the gradient of g is perpendicular to the tangent line 2g at our point. Now, what does it have to do with f? How is f maximized at this same point? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to parameterize the constraint curve using some parameterization, r of t equals x of t, y of t. Uh, for us, actually, it could be 5 cosine t and 5 sine t in our example. And um, such that t equals t naught corresponds to the point x naught, y naught. We create the composite function h, who will take and replace every x that's in f and every y that's in f with the 
parameterization components x of t and y of t. Now we have a function of t. This function gives the values of, that f takes on the constraint curve. It, it restricts f to be on the constraint curve. And if f is maximized at this point, then h is also going to be maximized at that point. The x not y not point that f is maximized at corresponds to the t not point, um, t not time when when h is maximized, made a single variable function. And so uh, the function single variable function is maximized when its derivative is equal to zero. Now, when we write what h of t is, and we want to take its derivative, we take the partial of f with respect to x, then we take multiply by the derivative of x with respect to t. So this is the chain rule, the partial of f with respect to y plus the derivative of y with respect to t. So this is going to be the derivative of h at t naught using the chain rule. Uh, this should be equal to 0 and we're going to set this up as a dot product between two vectors where we take the x partial and the y partial, make them components of a vector take the x prime and the y prime, make them components of a vector, and dot them accordingly, and this is equal to zero. Well, if we think of the first vector as the gradient of f, and the second vector is the derivative of the path, the r prime of t, um, at t naught, then this dot product is equal to zero. What does it mean when two vectors will have a dot product equal to zero, it means that they are orthogonal. So the gradient of f is also orthogonal to the tangent line to g at p. See, r, r prime of t is the tangent line because g was made up of the, the function r of t. And so its velocity vector or the derivative is also going to be the tangent line. So if the gradient of g is orthogonal to the tangent line and the gradient of f is orthogonal to the tangent line, then they must point in the same direction. At the point where f is maximized at, these guys must point in the same direction, thus telling us that the gradient of f is a scalar multiple of the gradient of g, which sets up our equation that will basically tell us how to set up the Lagrange multiplier method, the fact that the gradient of f is equal to lambda times the gradient of g. So this is an explanation. Um, we had our example that showed it, um, but really I wanted to give you also some, some steps that you can follow. It can be uh, very difficult to solve this set of equations that you're going to get, and uh, if you're given some structure, it might be helpful. And so on the next slide, I give you a way that I think uh, works really well. It gives you uh, some kind of idea about how to make all problems kind of work out the same kind of way. It requires you to create a new function called capital F, which is a combination of these two functions here. Let's go on the next slide to take a look at that. So we have this, this set, series of equations that set up Lagrange multiplier method. And what we're going to do is, instead of having it one guy equal to the other guy, we're going to have it set equal to zero. We're going to subtract the lambda times the gradient of g over and have it set equal to zero. And what we're going to do is make sure that um, your constraint g, in our example, was a x squared plus y squared equals 25. What we're going to do with that is make it equal to zero. And so make it x squared plus y squared minus 25 in our example. But this will be evident later. I'll tell you why. So you create this new function called capital F. It's a function of x and y but also of lambda. And if there was a z involved, then it'd be a function of z as well. And the way you create it is by taking your function f, who's the function that you're supposed to maximize or minimize, and subtracting lambda times the function g, who is your constraint function, this, this time the one that's set equal to zero. And what you do with this capital F is you take its gradient. It's a three-part gradient because there's three individual variables here. And so we want to solve where this capital F function has a gradient that's equal to zero. So that means that its x partial has to be equal to zero, its y partial has to be equal to zero, and at the same time, its lambda partial has to be equal to zero. And those are the equations 
that we get um, from from the original. Uh, having the lambda partial equal to zero is equivalent to just the constraint. This is why we set g equal to zero just by shipping shipping the constant over to the other side. Because when we go to take f lambda and set it equal to zero, we'll have exactly the constraint. So when it comes to these other two partials, fx and fy being equal to zero, that could be very problematic algebraically to solve. And so let me just give you some structure for it. Um, in doing this, uh, your goal, your big picture, is to get a relationship between x and y in, in solving the, the x partial and the y partial both being equal to zero. You want to get a relationship between x and y because what you want to do with that is then plug that into the constraint which at that point then would be a single variable equation. And so you can solve the single variable equation and then you can backtrack and figure out what the other variables are. It won't be important that you actually find out what lambda is, but uh, finding out what x and y are will be important. So here's my suggestion. You don't have to follow it, but it's helpful to make it through the algebraic maze that is trying to solve the x partial and the y partial both being zero simultaneously. I think that when you have those two equations, they will they will involve lambda, it's guaranteed, and you want to solve for lambda in each of them. Now be careful when you're doing that though because you might that might require you to um, divide by some function that has, you know, x or y in it and you know you can't divide by 0, so you must consider cases when those guys could be 0. But when you do that, when you solve for lambda in the in the x partial being equal to zero and you solve for when lambda in the y partial equals zero then you set those two guys equal to each other you want to find all such points that satisfy these equations at the same time and you want to evaluate your original function back at these points and so when you have that result what will happen is the largest value of f will be the maximum of the function and the constraint will be satisfied and the smallest value of f will be the minimum of the function and we'll be sure that the constraint will be satisfied by the way we set f lambda also equal to zero so this is the structure um, solve for lambda in, in the x partial solve for lambda in the y partial and set those two equal to each other and then um, and then solve that so we've seen an example as to what's going on behind the scenes between the the constraint curve and the level curves of your function. We've seen um, a description as to why the gradient of f must be equal to some lambda times the gradient of g. The fact that the two gradient functions, um, these these vector functions, are um, vectors that are or that point in the same direction, and they're both orthogonal to the tangent line. And so this is then this last slide is just um, a summary as to the action that you take to solve a Lagrange multiplier problem. I will add on more videos that will be us going through the actual examples, but this is just a, a concept video to help you kind of get an understanding of what's going on with the method of Lagrange multipliers. It's just solving a constrained optimization question. You have a function you want to optimize, you want to find the max or min of a function, but there is a constraint there is some kind of curve that must be true, some constraint curve. And so that's it.